तो दोस्तों अज मैं इतने आयो आयो आई स्टेट में अस टूर से वो साउथ डकोटा ये म्यूजियम है जिसे अस आया घूम अचो तो मैं तेखारा तो बेस्ट गो whole idea of frontier and what else is beyond and he grew up in his father's study poring over maps for hours at a time so when he became president he thought he had an opportunity to begin this westward expansion and so he reached out to napoleon and he said i would like to purchase the city of new orleans for 8 million dollars because new orleans was the trading port used by all of north and south america So Jefferson knew whoever controlled the port of New Orleans could essentially control economy for half of the world. So it was very important to him to purchase that. Napoleon writes back and says, "Well, you know what, Jefferson, I've got a lot of wars going on right now with a lot of people over here in Europe, and I'm really low on money. So instead of giving you the city of New Orleans for eight million dollars." You give me 15 million dollars and I will give you the entire Louisiana territory. Over 800,000 acres of land. So, not a bad bargain, right? You want a city and you get half a continent, really. So, <laughs> but as I tell the school children, if you spend 15 million dollars on something, don't you want to know what you just bought? Yeah, definitely. Right? So that's one of the reasons Jefferson planned the Lewis and Clark expedition. He wanted to know what was out there. And again, just the Louisiana territory, so not even the whole rest of the North American continent. Jefferson thought it would take 100 generations for Americans to inhabit the land. We did it in under 5. <laughs> We did not always use the best of methods, of course. Uh and we did not end up being very good caretakers of the land as it turned out, but we're working on it. So that's kind of part of the American experience, right? We're always working on it. <laughs> so I'm going to let President Jefferson give you the instructions that he gave to Lewis and Clark sure. and then we'll continue our journey through this area specifically. Sure, please. During the finding of the rumor direct route to the Pacific Ocean, known as the Northwest Passage, the Spanish, French, and British also want to discover that Northwest Passage. The nation that finds it first will control North America's destiny. In January of 1803, I wrote a secret message to Congress. I requested funds for an expedition led by my former personal secretary, Mary Weather Lewis. Congress granted my request. In June of 1803, I sent instructions to Lewis. I described my hopes and his responsibilities. I included the following instructions: Find the Northwest Passage. Carefully record what you observe and learn. Make two copies of your records in case one is lost or damaged. Record longitude and latitude so that maps may be made. Record descriptions of the natural environment, weather, and climate. Develop friendly relations with the native peoples. Learn about their tribal nations, their goods, languages, laws, traditions, and attitudes. How they farm, and fish, and hunt, create art, and battle in war. Give them peace medals and other gifts. Arrange for influential chiefs to visit Washington D.C. Captain Lewis, I give you absolute authority to carry out this military mission of exploring the West. May you and all who serve in this mission safely return with information that will benefit the scientific, commercial, and national interests of our great and growing country. So as you can see, it wasn't purely an economic expedition. Obviously commerce was a very important part of that puzzle, but it wasn't the only thing that Jefferson wanted to know. They had a list of things that they were supposed to do and one of them in particular in particular was to befriend the native tribes. Yeah. Because as I told the school children, imagine you wake up one morning and on your front yard is the entire United States military. <laughs> 
that'd be a little scary, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so Lewis and Clark on a military expedition really had to make sure to make those good relationships with the Native Americans. And without the help of the Native Americans, there's no way they could have survived this journey. Yeah. So let's move our journey a little further into the museum and we're going to talk about Sergeant Charles Now we have a lot of things named after this guy around here, and that's because, yep, come all the way in, there's plenty of room over here yet. Um, he's one of what we call the 10 young men of Kentucky. Lewis and Clark, when they were recruiting men for this expedition, they really wanted young men from Kentucky for a couple of different reasons. First of all, these young men were incredibly wealthy. They were from very wealthy plantation owners in Virginia. And so being wealthy back then meant that you were educated. They knew how to read and write. That was a very important piece to Lewis and Clark. The other reason is these young men went from Virginia to Kentucky and they grew up on the frontier. So from a young age, they knew how to fish and hunt and make their own clothes and cook and build structures and keep themselves safe from wildlife. So they had all of those skills already and Lewis and Clark would not need to spend a lot of time training them. So going back to the education piece of this, Lewis and Clark had the foresight to think, okay, well we're keeping journals as part of the military record, but really everyone who can should be keeping a journal on this journey. Now, looking back where we stand in history now, why might that be important? for everyone to keep a journal. Different perspectives. Absolutely right. As I tell the school children, the way we study history is we have to get everybody's story and put it together to figure out the truth of what happened. Because then I tell the kids, if the fight broke out in your class, but I only take one person's story, it's not fair. fair. Right. And they all, I love seeing their little light bulbs pop up. It's so cute. <laughs> so that's, again, another theme that we're trying to encourage with our education programming is that we have, we incorporate the European American experience, of course, because it was significant, but we also have to look at the Native American experience. We also have to look at the experience of enslaved Americans and African Americans and people of color in this country because it is so important to put all of the stories together. All right, let's hear what Charlie has to say about his experience. Yes. My name is Charles Floyd, one of three sergeants on the Lewis and Clark Expedition, instructed by President Thomas Jefferson to find and map the Northwest Passage that will open our country to great prosperity. It was August 1st, 1803. I was 21 years old. A constable carrying mail between Louisville, Kentucky and Vincennes, Indiana Territory. When Captain Clark recruited me, one of the first three permanent members of the Corps of Discovery. He and Captain Meriwether Lewis saw leadership ability and physical strength in me. They made me one of their three sergeants. Captain Lewis later would call me a young man of much merit. As a sergeant, I commanded a small squad of soldiers. I rotated work on the keelboat and supervised basics of camp life. This freed the captains to work on the expedition's diplomatic and scientific objectives. As a sergeant, I was required to keep a journal as a record of our voyage, in case the captain's journals were lost. I was proud to serve on this mission into the treacherous unknown, to carry out my duties, to abide by my captain's orders to the best of my abilities to cooperate fully in reaching our destination, the Pacific Ocean. With my own eyes, I would see the Pacific Ocean and encounter all wonder and hardship that lay before it. I would return home to tell the story. I died of natural causes on August 20th, 1804, here in this land, just three months after our departure from St. John and more than a year before the Corps of Discovery saw the Pacific Ocean. My journal is all that is left to commemorate my part in this important expedition. 
So Charles Floyd died in what we now know was a burst appendix. Uh, of course, in you know, the 18th century, early 19th century, we did not have the same medical knowledge as European Americans. We did not have the same medical knowledge um, as other parts of the world and, and as we do now. So there's nothing that Lewis and Clark could have done to save him. He was the only member of the expedition to die on the journey, which is pretty remarkable. And he actually died about a mile and a half from where we're standing right now. Oh, okay. So let's move a little further into the room and we'll talk about how Lewis and Clark honored his, their friend and how we honor him still today. and put this idea of democracy into work, into practice. And so they held an election to find his replacement. And it was the very first democratic election west of the Mississippi River. And it took place right in this area. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, they elected Sergeant Patrick Gass. All of the men voted and elected Sergeant Patrick Gass because they felt he was responsible and he was likable, he was fair-minded, and he, again, was educated, so he was able to keep a journal. The Journal of Patrick Gass was the first of the Lewis and Clark journals to be published in the United States, and it was published around the year 1830. He also turned out to be the longest living member of the expedition, and he lived well into his 90s and didn't die until the 1870s, I believe. So, Patrick Gass, pretty cool dude. <laughs> One of the not cool dudes on the expedition, of course, was the deserter Moses Reed. Moses Reed tried to run away and go home. Well, he was discovered by a Native American scouting party, and so they knew that there were um, European Americans in the area. They took Moses Reed back to the Lewis and Clark encampment, and he was court-martialed. He was sentenced to 100 lashes of cat and nine tails through a gauntlet. So men lined up on either side. Each man had a cat of nine tails, and he would be whipped as he ran through the gauntlet. Um, after that, they had to keep him with him for a little while, but ultimately he was dishonorably discharged and he was sent home halfway through the journey. And so he was, didn't get the reward, he didn't get the land, he lived the rest of his life in disgrace basically. So let's move into this hallway and look at our last animatronic exhibit. This one we are really, really, really proud of because we were one of the very first Lewis and Clark interpretive centers or museums along the entire trail to discuss the story of this man. I'm gonna let him begin his story and then I'll fill in some of the details when he's finished. I am York. I was born to be the slave and body servant of the young William Clark. In 1803, Master William Clark was contacted by his old friend Meriwether Lewis to help command an expedition to find a route to the ocean out west. Of course, I was to come on the trip and leave my wife and family behind, but who knows how long. On the trail, I helped with everything, mapping, hunting, pushing and poling the boat, and protecting what we had. I had a gun which meant I had the trust of the men. No slave was ever allowed to carry a gun. I cared for poor Sergeant Floyd when he came. None of the 
captain's medicines could make him better. We buried him atop a hill by what they called Floyd's River. I saw and did amazing things on this journey. I saw places where few white men had ever been. I climbed snow-capped mountains and swam swift-moving rivers. I walked among the native people who welcomed me with open arms. They were amazed at my black skin and called me Big Mess. And I was there when we finally reached the ocean waters. Now I ask that you remember me in my name, so my voice and my story will be heard for generations and generations to come. So, he worked with the foreign slave. Uh, he was the slave of Captain William Clark. And enslaved Americans at that time were not legally allowed to have weapons. And so the fact that Lewis and Clark allowed York to have a gun was pretty remarkable. Also, you remember when I talked about those elections that they would have? They let York have the vote. Even though it would be almost 200 years until American, black Americans and enslaved Americans could vote legally and safely in this country. So that, again, shows how much they trusted and respected York as a part of their party. They also let Sacago Wea cast a vote. Again, 150 years before women would be given the right to vote in this country. So when I say Lewis and Clark really practiced that, that idea of democracy, boy, they really practiced it. Mm. Their idea of democracy was if you're doing an each, if you're giving an equal contribution to the group, you deserve an equal say in the in the decisions. So we're very thankful for that. Looking back, <laughs> um, uh, I forgot where I was going. <laughs> oh, so Sacagawea, Sacagawea. We have two ways we say her name. One way is the European American pronunciation, which is Sacagawea. The reason we hear some people now say Sacagawea is because she was a Shoshone woman. And in the Shoshone language, her name, Bird Woman, would be pronounced Sacagawea. Sacaga is the word for bird in Shoshone, and Wea is the word for woman. And so if we're using the Shoshone pronunciation of her name, it would be Sakagawea. However, <laughs> the, the Shoshone nation recognizes and publicly acknowledges that European Americans have been saying Sacagawea for a really long time. So they're not offended if they hear it pronounced the other way. So as I tell the school children, the correct answer is both answers which is my favorite kind of question. <laughs> so let's talk a little more about Native culture as we move into our final hallway here. The people who were living in this area at the time Lewis and Clark came through was the Lakota Nation. And again, we have two different terms for the same group of people. We referred to them for a very long time as Sioux, S-I-O-U-X, just like Sioux City, right? Well, the difference is, Sioux is a European word that means little snakes. Yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's not very respectful, it's not very kind. And so the word Lakota in their language actually means friendship. So I try to encourage the school children to say Lakota, because when you're talking about a people and a culture, don't disrespect them, right? They are Lakota. But if you're talking about places on a map, like Sioux City or Sioux Falls, you're going to actually see Sioux a lot on your trip. <laughs> Those are names on a map, and they don't hurt anyone's feelings. So we try to teach a little compassion. <laughs> the wall behind you is a mural by a Native American artist, Henry Payer Jr. He's actually become quite world famous for his depictions of Native American life and his use of traditional Native American methods in his art. Uh, this is one of the murals he did for us. He's done several murals for us and comes back on a regular basis to give lectures and those kinds of things as well. The buffalo was a sacred animal to Native American society. So if you killed one, you had to use every part of the animal. 
Otherwise, it was incredibly disrespectful and it would anger, you know, this great spirit and it was all around bad. So, part of the way they would make sure to use all of the buffalo is by using little pieces they couldn't use for anything else and making toys. These are some Native American toys and games. They were made for us by um, the existing Lakota Nation, who now lives near Rosebud, South Dakota. They were made using traditional Native American methods. They are traditional Native American items. So the, what you see in these cases is exactly what children 220 years ago were playing with. My favorite is the sled made from buffalo bones because we have a lot of great hills around here and when it snows in the winter time, we take the children sledding down the hills. So I can, I just really can envision that. Oh, okay. yep, this one right here. That kind of wraps up the formal part of our tour. I have some free workbooks and informational books on the front desk for you, as well as my business card. I'm always happy to provide lesson plans or ideas or crafts that you can do with students. I also do virtual tours online, so we can book those easily. You just send me an email and I'll get back to you. You're welcome. So, those though,